Olá, começando mais uma conversa sobre os filmes em exibição, nessa nona edição do Festival Olhar de Cinema. A gente está aqui com a diretora e com a artista multimídia Mariah Garnett para falar sobre seu filme Trouble, um filme que parte da relação pessoal entre Mariah e seu pai e se inspirá-la na investigação histórica e política sobre os conflitos da Irlanda do Norte. O filme teve suas primeiras exibições ainda no ano passado e quase que simultaneamente no BFI London Film Festival e no New York Film Festival. E agora tem sua estreia brasileira e sua estreia, na verdade, na América do Sul, na Mostra Outros Olhares, Festival Olhar de Cinema. So, hi Mariah, thanks for being here with us. And well, to start our talk, uh, I guess biographical and autobiographical films often makes audience curious about what is cinema and what is life taking its course in unpredictable ways, you know, and I guess making you some kind of binary question about your film is wouldn't make any sense, but <laughs> I bet uh, people who are seeing Trouble at the festival would like to know a little better about how you decided to combine both of these things like meeting and building a relation with your father and making a film about him at the same time, you know, like if there was any starting point or something like this, the whole yeah. project. Um, there was a starting point. So this film, This was probably the fourth or fifth time I met him when I started filming there. Um, and I came up with the idea because he started to get back in contact with his brothers and sisters um, through this web website called, what's it called? Belfast Forum. Um, and it's kind of this, this website where exiles and people who left try to reconnect and they share pictures of, you know, their old neighborhoods because the city's changed so much like a lot of the um the old houses have either been demolished or bombed or just their bad construction and fell down um <clears throat> so yeah it's this forum for people to like reconnect and you know a lot of people are like oh do you remember this family they lived on this street whatever happened to them so that's how he found his um brother who lived in Scotland and then they started like sending emails back and forth and um, that's where he got those pictures of himself as a young man that appear in the film uh, from his brother. Um, so when I saw that happening I was like oh this would be really interesting to make a film where like I go to get to know him better while he's getting to know his family again who he hasn't seen in 30 no 50 I don't know since 1971 I can't do the math but um So I figured it would be these parallel sort of like reunion stories and then I'd go with him to Northern Ireland and, you know, underneath all that would be these questions about the conflict and, <clears throat> and media representation and, um, you know, these two sides um, that sort of divided, I mean, in some ways they divided his family. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, I actually had kind of a clear vision for the film and idea setting out. And um, I didn't tell him about it before I got there, but then when I got there, I was like, this is what I want to do while I'm here. And he was like, okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, it like it always kind of had, like it, it ended up kind of being what I thought it was going to be in the beginning, but there's a couple parts where it diverged. Like I didn't really end up meeting any of his family members. I met one cousin, but the rest of them I didn't really meet. Um, so then it kind of wound up being more focused on his friends and political involvement. Um, because I, I guess I could just kind of discovered like the family, you know, he left home so young, I think he was like 13 or 14 when he left home. So, and that wasn't really that close of a family because their mother died when they were, uh, when he was like right after he was born. Um, so like my idea of like a reunion meant something totally different to him and his family. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, it definitely, it felt like, making it felt like it kept going off script, but it actually ended up being pretty close to what I had imagined it would be in the first place. Yeah. That's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and seeing trouble, I had this strong sensation about you making Belfast 
a city for your own experiences, even if in a temporary way. Mm -hmm. And in a way, um, that was impossible for your father in his youth, I guess. And when he says, he, he, he talks about his background family and their relation between them, there are a lot of unspoken stories, isn't it? And he also mentioned about writing new letters he would never send. So I was thinking about this, about you making the film uh, uh, um, experience of building a relation with your father and also with the, his, his city, Belfast. Mm -hmm. But if, if do you feel like in any sense you are building new memories for things that were left behind, I don't know. May I just interrupt briefly to uh, just add a clarification, or not a clarification, but an addendum. There's this interesting geographical tripartite aspect in the film, which is that the origin myth, so to speak, um, of your parents and much of the action of the film is in Northern Ireland. Your father, David, is in Austria, in Vienna, and mm -hmm. you are a person who was born in the United States coming from there. So yeah. that's an interesting, dimension of this question as well for me. Yeah, um, I, one thing that maybe I didn't really make clear in the film, but it probably could have made more clear was that the woman in the, um, in the footage is not my mom. Um, so my mother is not from Northern Ireland and they met, <clears throat> they met probably like 10 years after he left at like a youth hostel in Athens and they were like hippies backpacking around Europe. So like, that's like a whole other story. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so yeah, I was born in the States. I was raised in the States by my mom and my mom's family. And I did have contact with him like through letters, kind of sporadic letters. Um, I guess there were a bunch that he didn't send also. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Like I always knew who he was and where he was, but I just never went there until I was like 27. Um, and then over the next, I guess, eight years or so, I went a handful of times, but never spent more than like a total of a week there in, the, in those visits um, with him. Um, so this was definitely the longest period of time I spent there. Um, I think I forgot what the original question was. It was like about my relationship to Belfast. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was, it was strange in the making of this film because I had applied to a residency in Belfast to work on this film like two years before or something. Um, and then, or I had applied and then they lost their funding and they were like, uh, our, we don't have an international residency anymore. And then I, you know, made this plan to go. I was going to be with my dad for six weeks. And then I was like, I'll, I'll just go to Belfast on my own and figure it out and stay for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or something. Um, and then I got a call from them that was like, do you want to come at like the exact time I was planning on going anyway? Uh, so then I was there for two months. So it felt like weirdly faded um, to all, like all these elements came together at the right time. Um, and yeah, my first impressions of the city, I was intimidated by it. It was, you know, kind of I, things that I'd never really been to England or the UK before. So I didn't, there was a lot of things about the city that I didn't know were just like a working class, you know, British or British Isles um, aesthetic, like shards of glass on the top of all the walls to prevent people from um, breaking into people's houses or, I don't know, there's this like foreboding um aesthetic that i didn't know was just kind of a function of like all the working class cities around there looked like that um so i was really intimidated at first but then i met one person and the second i met one person that i became friends with then i met all these other people and then i developed this really close relationship to not only a group of people but also the city um i really fell in love with it i, I love it there i would kind of move there in a heartbeat if there was anything for me to do there still. Um, so yeah, and like the history of political activism is really interesting there. Um, there's all these parallels to America and the political landscape here um, that they were directly referencing in the 60s, but then it seems like it's all bubbling up again here. 
Um, so yeah, it just, it kind of felt like this alternate universe to America in some ways, like the things that played out there in the late sixties were trying to happen here in some ways, but it's just too big here. Um, for, and like, it's, it's the only place where that sort of like sixties revolutionary impulse in the, you know, in the West Western world, um, actually escalated into a war. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, like it was all like threat, people were he here were threatened by it. And in the England, they were threatened. And, you know, in France, there was like the occupations that, and that happened in 68, but like it didn't, this was like a 30 year war, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but a lot of the tensions were really parallel to the tensions here, like racial tensions here. So I was kind of interested in like how, how the conflict started and how it was resolved and um, yeah, just like that shift from uh, civil rights activism to full-scale war. <laughs> um, does that answer the question? I don't know. There might, I might have left some things out there, but. <laughs> no, we are just talking and so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Everyone has uh, a cat. <laughs> and here's my cat for the whole world to see. Her name is Bayana. Oh my God. Um, excuse me. In addition to uh, racial and religious and political questions, the film deals with um, questions of queer identity, as much of your work does. Uh, mm -hmm. I have heard you say that you feel that Trouble is a work that is queer more so in form than in theme. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you believe, continue to believe that that is true. And if so, how is that the case? How is the form of the film queer? Um, well, I don't know that it's more, more queer. I just, I think for a long time, like the moniker of like queer filmmaker, I understood it to mean that everything I made had to be specifically about queer people. Um, and I mean, this obviously has got queer content because I'm the main character <laughs> um, and I'm queer. But I think like, like there's a difference for me between like making a work that's like thinking about queer identity and like actively trying to like, you know, deconstruct or do something about queer identity and making a film where I'm in it that's about a lot of other things, you know? So that's kind of the distinction I'm trying to make with Trouble. It's like, um, it might not necessarily seem like a queer film, because it's about like the conflict in Northern Ireland, but then at the same time it is because I'm in it and also the formal stuff that you were just asking about. So formally, I think, you know, my understanding of it being queer is that it's of what, like the whole thing is about avoiding binaries and sort of like blurring the lines. Um, so it's not really a documentary. It's not really, um, well, it's definitely not a narrative fiction film, but it's, I use some of those strategies too. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of like the narration is told in, in text, like my internal state is told in, in text and that's questionable too. Like it's all kind of unreliable in terms of like, um, being able to like pin it down to one kind of form and, um, and it switches a lot between different modes. So some of it's just stuff I shot on my iPhone. Some of it's like, you know, set up interviews or, um, narrative reenactments. So yeah, I think that's what I mean about the form being queer. And I feel like when I, I feel like with Full Burn is actually when I started to think about that um, specifically because I was like moving into this territory where I was making films about, like the, that film is about like the most masculine straight men that I, you know, I could kind of find um, who are uh, special ops US military guys who then became stuntmen. Um, but I think of that as kind of a queer film because it's about my interactions with them in a way and like building this relationship between us. And then also the form is so weird um, because it's like this split screen thing. And a lot of the imagery is like kind of sexualized. Um, so it's a different movie, but um, yeah, I think that's when I first started to think about like, how can I make queer films that aren't necessarily, you know, just about like, who the main character's partner is and, um, and that kind of trajectory. And that is a film called Full Burn from what year? 2014, so that was the one I made right before I started Trouble.
different. I finished before. that in before. Yeah, I finished that in June, and then I started Trouble in December of the same year. Yeah, um, we're glad you got into trouble from there. Um, <laughs> so, and I wanted to make that joke at some point. Um, so, <laughs> uh, the character you you as you spoke, I thought about the character of Mariah in the film. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to know, you know, in addition, first, in addition to everything else, in addition to being an installation and film artist, you're also a performance artist. And I'm interested to know what interests you about your presence as a figure in the film. And in addition, what you think of the character of Mariah in this film, how she's working and how you feel she conveys your story versus her own. Mm -hmm. Um. Hmm, that's a good question. I feel like, well, I think a, a lot of, I've always kind of used my own image and body as like a vessel for um, like complicating these ideas about like truth and documentary. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of like, at this point, we all are media savvy enough to know that, you know, um, what you see on screen isn't necessarily true. But well, like when I was an undergrad in my documentary production class, like they were talking about documentaries as a reflection of the subjectivity of the maker, like as a framing device. Um, and when I was 20, that was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know? But so I feel like I've taken that idea and kind of pushed it as far as I can. That's sort of one of the reasons I appear in them so often is to like continually remind the audience that this is like my, what I, something I'm making um, and that it's artifice. Um, so, but yeah, in terms of the character, is that noise really loud in the background? We can no. hear you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so in terms of myself as a character, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I left out about my experience. Like I've had people say like, we didn't actually get to know you at all. Like, <laughs> um, and yeah, I like didn't really talk about my feelings, which like I had a lot of feelings making this movie. Um, I talked about some of my anxieties, but not really like my emotions so much. Um, so yeah, I think my character is often just kind of like a stand in for knowing that this film isn't, um, you know, straight truth, but it's also kind of, I feel like I'm also kind of trying, especially specifically in trouble, like standing in for the audience um, mm -hmm. because I was kind of like the dumb American who didn't know anything about the conflict and I'm like learning about it as I'm making the film. So that was kind of like a little bit of a trick I feel like to get the film to speak to more than one audience. Um, because that was something I was really concerned about when I was making the film. It was like, how am I gonna make a film about Northern Ireland that Americans can watch and Northern Irish people can watch? Um, because so many films and media representations of that place are made for people from not, who aren't from there. So they're completely oversimplified. Um, and, you know, there's no way to like make an hour and a half movie about that conflict. and get everything you need to get in there um, that speaks to all audiences. So I think I was trying to like filter that kind of information of like who the two sides were and like all the sort of like boring factual stuff through my own experience so that it wasn't just like me telling, or it wasn't just me as a filmmaker telling the audience like what happened. It was like me as a person learning how that story has been told in a way, if that makes sense. Um. <laughs> Camila? Uh, no, I was thinking like, uh, seeing trouble, there's some aspects which seems really close for us here in Brazil, and I guess for you in the US too, like the mm -hmm. colonial, I always have trouble to speak this word, but heritage and heritage oh yeah Her heritage yes <laughs> thanks Errol. Uh, but at the same time it is really hard to understand what is what was happening there because of these racial issues i, I guess because for us here racism is a central point about the colonial 
every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know if you could speak a, a little more about how you related to these two contexts, the American context and the Northern Ireland context. Yeah. And how you navigated between them. And yeah. that was something that occurred to me as I watched the film that to a certain, you have a work called Other and Father. Um, mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, you and your father in the film work as mirrors of each other, sometimes literally and sometimes in a more thematic way. And perhaps that has to do with the question as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, for white people, <laughs> Northern Ireland is like an interesting case study because it's like, I mean, for me as someone who's, you know, relatively liberal and well-educated and stuff, I still, like, I feel like going there and seeing the consequences of this colonial history made me understand what was going on in the States in a whole other way. Um, and like the repercussions of you know, damage from colonialism. Um, and, you know, I think that has something to do with like identification. Um, so, I mean, it's weird because the Irish have been used by like racist Americans for a while now as a way of like uh, undermining um, what I guess what they see as like complaints about colonialism. But if you go to Ireland, like that's not what's happening there. Um, there's like this sort of like very sophisticated analysis of um, imperialism and uh, what the damage is done there specifically, but also like an impulse, like the Republican, Irish Republicans um, who are, you know, largely identified as Catholic and Republicans just mean like want an Irish Republic as opposed to being colonized by the English. Um, they spent a lot of time and effort like reaching out to other global struggles um, and like were very intentional about like aligning themselves politically with other um, instances of colonial, um, you know, legacies of colonialism. So like there's this, there's this very strong connection between Israel, Palestine and Northern Ireland. Um, and actually weirdly, so it's like the Republicans were um, very identified with Palestinians and um, flying Palestinian flags and stuff. And now the loyalists who are the ones that want to remain in the UK are flying Israeli flags. So there's these weird identifi identifications on both sides. Um, but yeah, um, it, I think like before going there and also like going back to the States and talking to people about it there, um, you know, a lot of Americans are like, they're all just a bunch of redheads who look exactly alike. like, what's the problem? And they're all Christian, like, what's the problem? Um, and it just kind of, I don't know, I feel like it sort of like lifts the veil a little bit on like these artificial, both the importance of like identity, I like categories of identity, but also like the artificiality of it, you know? Um, Cause there's all of these like the uh, ways that, this actually I thought was really queer there. I think of Northern Ireland as a very queer place actually, but there's all these like codes that they can read like what side they were raised on, which like range from like colors of t-shirts that they're wearing to ways of pronunciation of certain, you know, roads or, or letters. Like the Catholics, um, pronounce my dad's road that he grew up on in a specific way and Protestants um, pronounce it a different, slightly different way. So that's a way of sort of like identifying. And I would like intentionally kind of mangle it because I could never remember which was which. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I feel like being there where like there is no like visual distinction and they, they have all these jokes about how there's no visual distinction. like. Protestants say Catholics' eyes are closer together. Catholics say Protestants' eyes are closer together. Like, there's no way. It's like people who've been in the same tiny little radius for like thousands of years, you know, um, a pretty restricted gene pool. It's not like there's these wild, wild differences in appearance. So like in a huge country that has like a legacy of like racism basically and chattel slavery like Brazil or America, um, 
from the outside it doesn't really make sense but then like when you get up close it is just like it's not the same thing but it's stemming from these similar places of imperialism and subjugation of colonial subjects um so uh, i guess that answers the question <laughs> yes yeah it does we yeah. are uh virtually out of time okay I can ask a last question. Camila, do you want to ask a last question? Please. <laughs> okay. So Trouble is a very rare film in contemporary cinema in many regards. Um, good, good ways. Um, <laughs> and one way in which it's a particularly rare film for film festivals is that it has a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Does it? <laughs> I see a happy ending. Yeah. I won't. I won't tell the audience what the happy ending is, but <laughs> okay. I, I I see something happy there. Um, yeah. And so I want to know from you. Uh, you know, with the world and the various places that the film touches on being so turbulent in nature, um, what hope you see, if any? Uh, what you, what positives you can see in the future for your work for the states for Ireland? Yeah. And anywhere else you want to touch on. <laughs> and then if there's anything else you want to add. Yeah. Um, well, I think like the happy ending that you're referring to, it's like what I was looking for in the place and in my own story with my dad was not necessarily like an ending. You know, it was kind of, I, I think that's one of the other ways that the film is queer. It's like there's, um, there's a story. I, I Okay. One of my like things I say about it is that it's a, failed movie about a failed relationship set against the backdrop of a failed a failed movie about a failed relationship set against the backdrop of a failed revolution sorry i like opened this and then it suddenly switched to these and i don't know how to switch it back <laughs> um yeah so the um backdrop of a failed revolution and uh, yeah so in those failures other things happen and one movie I just watched recently that I feel like kind of sums up a little bit of my perspective is this film called To Live. It's a Chinese film. Um, and it is kind of about like the cultural revolution there in this one family that all these horrible things happen to, but they just kind of keep living. Um, and there's like happy moments, there's sad moments. It's kind of, It's kind of a devastating film, but it's also... I'm like, is this a happy ending? I don't know. Um, so I was kind of trying to do that with Trouble, I think, just like thinking about like in films, you, you want something to happen and then there'd be a consequence and then there'd be a conclusion. Um, and in my film, that doesn't really happen. Um, and it, kind of my own desire in my relationship with my dad was to like ask him questions, find out the answers and then have some kind of re resolution with him. But really what happened was I asked them those questions, I found out the answers, and then I was like free to have a normal relationship with him. It wasn't like, now I know, so I feel this way. It's like, now I know that stuff, so now I'm going to go on a walk and, you know, make dinner and play cards and stuff. And that's actually where the relationship came from, not from these interviews and, and question answering sessions. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of that. Uh, oh, wait, hope for the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's hope for the world in that. I mean, like, you know, this, we're getting a lot thrown at us right now. And some of us are going to make it through and some of us aren't. And that's like, just kind of the way it's always been um, in a lot of ways. Um, so I don't know, it's necessarily hopeful. Like, it's devastating. It's sad. It's like, you know, Nobody, I don't want anyone to die. I wanted to have a different kind of relationship with my dad, but that's not what happened. And the one I have is good and fine. And the one it is, you know, so I don't know. I mean, it feels really dismissive to just say it is what it is, but in a way that's like that kind of how I feel like we're going to get through it. Um, it's just to like keep staying alive. And I have no idea what my work is going to, I'd like my work doesn't, I don't, I have no idea what it is right now. I'm kind of like, does this matter? Do I care about anything? Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to make stuff in the face of that, but it is, 
very confusing time in terms of like why make anything and what to make. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly helpful, but <laughs> yeah. I, I was no just not the happen. opposite of who was no. expecting. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I find it inspiring and, you know, that the artist is a very powerful figure in his or her, its ability to make something from the mess. Um, yeah. I find, I find that inspiring, in fact. And I thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. I would like to know if you can tell us, if you know, how to say thank you in Gaelic. I don't. <laughs> That's fine. I don't know so, how to say really anything in Gaelic. <laughs> okay. So we can, we can just say thank you in English here and obrigado. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And obrigada. <laughs> Hope to see you someday in Brazil. Yeah, I know. Me too. Thanks so much for showing the film. I'm excited to hear what the response is.